Watch the game wherever I'm at. All right, well, it is Friday afternoon. The Audible is on the air. Two days till the Dolphins face the New England Patriots up in Foxborough. Game two of the season for both of them. Joining me, former tight end for the Miami Dolphins, Troy, Dray- Troy Drayton. And uh, Troy, uh, talk about the Dolphins starting off the season with a, uh, with, a, with a hefty schedule. Go up to Seattle, face a very good team in the Seattle Seahawks. Come back down here, get to catch your breath a little bit before you head back up to New England in a place that has been... I guess I guess the words I would say is extremely difficult for the Dolphins yeah. to go up there, and I think the last time they won up there may have been the uh, the Wildcat year when they when they broke <laughs> the Wildcat on them. They, yeah. they stunned them up there with the Wildcat, but that may be the last time that they've won up in New England. Yeah, I mean well, when you think about the Miami Dolphins, uh, you know the Miami Dolphins they ha- they have a tough time winning up in uh, in New England. Yeah. So I think really what you have to do is you have to play your game. You have to go up there. You have to be able to hit the, the quarterback number yeah. one. Uh, you have to play great defense, but I think you have to be able to control the clock. You have to keep the uh, the New England offense on the sideline more well, more importantly, but you also have to execute on defense and and then you have to make some plays on special teams. And I think uh, if you can do if you can play all three phases and win in all three phases, uh, the Miami Dolphins have a chance to win. Yeah, and that's it. I think you know it's, it's winning. It's not making mistakes. It's it's doing the things. And and I tell you, one of the things that uh, that I was I, I liked about the Dolphins in the last game. I only had four four penalties. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think uh, I want to if I just off the top of my head, I, I want to say Seattle had eight penalties or something. If, so the Dolphins were like four for for forty yards or something, mm-hmm. as opposed to what they had been in the past couple of years, where they've been racking up. You know, they've been shooting themselves in the foot so many times that it, it just uh, it, it became a self fulfilling prophecy that they they couldn't win football games. But mm-hmm. you know, I, I think this football team and any football team, at least in my mind, the more you can limit the penalties, the more you can keep from giving away. Stopping drives by by offensive penalties, continue, allowing the opposing team to continue drives by making penalties on the defensive side of the football, very important. And no doubt, when you're on the road, even much more important. So we'll see if the Dolphins can kind of mimic what they did in Seattle uh, and play a, a clean game, a, a fairly clean game, uh, where it comes from uh, as far as the penalties are concerned. Troy, before we get going here, let me go through some of the uh, uh, some of the injury situations because the New England, at least I hadn't seen the New England injury report for today. Uh, is not out yet. The Dolphins injury report is out. Arian Foster, practiceful. Now, everybody I mention here is listed right now as questionable. Well, that's a pretty vague thing in the National Football <laughs> League. Questionable. You know, I used to, I remember when I was playing, I'd see a question, I'm like, oh, that guy might not play. And then you line up and hey, there he is. So you, you, you kind of forget about questionable in, in this league. So anyway, Arian Foster, limp practice full today in full, uh, uh, participated in full, full practice. He's questionable. Uh, Xavier Howard, limited in practice. He's questionable. Pretty much uh, expect him to play. Jelani Jenkins, limited, questionable. Uh, Devontae Parker, limited, questionable. I think all those guys we spoke of there will play. Jordan Phillips was full, so he's questionable. Probably play. And probably the best news out today was Mario Williams' practice. He's still in that concussion protocol, um, but evidently he's moved on to the point where he can go out and practice. And it leads me to believe that there's probably a pretty good chance that he's going to play on Sunday. And the way he played up in uh, up in Seattle with Indomitian and with Cam Wake, boy, I tell you, it'd, it'd be great to have him back out there and, and play the same way that, that he played last week because uh, he, he put a lot of pressure on. And more importantly, one thing I haven't seen is he, he's done a, he did a great he did a great job of when. Russell Wilson tried to run that little naked bootleg to get mm-hmm. some time. He was out there and you know kept him from you know had to make him force him to pull up, throw the ball or, or throw the ball away a couple of times. So it, it'll be nice to have him uh, available for the game. No, absolutely. I think Mario Williams is, is one of the key is is to to you know roughing the quarterback and, and roughing up the quarterback. Yep. And and when you have a guy that's collapsing the pocket, a guy that's disciplined, uh, he's seen it all. And and to me, I think he is that 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 component that we need. I mean, you have Cam Wake coming in on a limited basis. I think they're, they're talking about limiting his play count or at least watching his yep. play count. And you got Indomitian pushing the pocket. I mean, I, I think that makes for a master plan. So hopefully we can get we can get Mario back and and we can go into this thing uh, uh, full full force and, and at 100% because, you know, I, I think when you have a guy that's coming off the corner like Cam and Mario and, and, and you're pushing the pocket, I think, you know, now it, you're forced to step on the, up in the pocket, yep. get rid of the ball faster, and uh, now now it gives our, our defensive backs a chance to make plays and gives our linebackers a chance to make plays as well. Yeah, with Jimmy Garoppolo back there, certainly played well enough to win uh, in another tough place to play in Arizona, beating the Cardinals out there. Uh, and he played a pretty good game, you know, didn't make any big mistakes. 
But I think this is a this is a day where the Dolphins need to rough him up a little bit. They need to make him move in the pocket. They can't let him be comfortable back there. If they can put the pressure on, you get that pressure from inside. And Jordan Phillips, I said, uh, he he practiced in full pads and, and really played very well yeah. for this football team. I think it's nice to see him in his second year really coming into his own. I think he understands how you have to play in the National Football League now. And I think they've got him conditioned to the point yeah. where he doesn't need to take so many plays off. And, and that's a big situation for him. So I think once again, much like last week, you know, a lot of the pressure is going to fall on the on the on the shoulders of that defensive front yes. to try to control the line of scrimmage and move on. And you look at the offensive line for the uh, for New England. Nate Solder, he's on. He's been limited. He he's questioned with a hamstring. Uh, and uh, and Sebastian Vollmer, their other starting tackle, he's out for the duration uh, or for a while, for quite a while here. So you know they're going to have some changes in there on the offensive line uh, that the Dolphins are going to need to try to take advantage of. No, I, I think you need to take advantage of. Anytime you have guys who are backups who are playing, you need your veteran guys to step up. And ultimately, it's the one-on-one battles that you have to win. And Dominican has to win. He has to beat those double teams. Jordan Phillips has to beat his one-on-one battle. Mario has to beat his one-on-one battle with the left tackle. And Cam Wake definitely yep. has to beat his one-on-one battles with the with the right tackle. I mean, you're right. The key to the success of this Miami Dolphins uh, football team this year and, and more importantly for a victory up in, in, up in New England is our front four. Our front four guys have to play extremely well, make Garoppolo uh, very uncomfortable in the pocket and make him get rid of the ball uh, early and often. But more importantly, they have to get him on the ground and, and, and kind of get him gun shy. And, and, and to me, I think those four guys are the key to success. Hey, you've tuned into the Audible here. Kim Bocamp or Troy Drayton with you. We'll be with you until around 5 o'clock. If you want to get some questions in, go ahead and send them, uh, uh, send them via Facebook, the Miami Dolphins Facebook page. We're also on Periscope. We're also on, uh, on MiamiDolphins.com. And if you want to watch any of the archived shows, you can either go on MiamiDolphins.com, look at videos, and go to Miami Dolphins Facebook page, look on videos, and you can go ahead and check those out. We've got some questions coming in. And this is one of the things that I wanted to talk to you since you are a, a tight end or a former tight end in the National Football League. Uh, Bill uh, sends a question to Troy. What are your thoughts about our group of tight ends? And so it leads to my question being, we got to get more production out of our tight ends. <laughs> <laughs> that answers your, your question a little bit, Bill. At least that's the way I see it. Look, you know, uh, uh, Jam... Um, uh, Jordan Cameron, he, he's he's, he's got to be more productive. Yes, got to make plays. Uh, he's had a he struggled since training camp, struggled since a preseason game catching footballs. He's got to find a way to make some catches and, and get his, his confidence back. But I tell you what, I would like to see him throw the ball to Deion Sims yes. more and more and more because I think Deion is probably the only guy that doesn't believe he can catch as well as he catches because <laughs> the coaches, I know the coaches yeah. feel very good about his ability to catch the football uh, and would like to see him be more of a part of the passing game. Well, you know, when I when I look at uh, Jordan Cameron, I, I think of Julius Thomas. I mean, when you look at the way that Julius Thomas was used in the Denver offense, you want to use uh, Jordan Cameron in the same way that Julius Thomas was used in Denver. And that's how I see him him being used. But he has to gain his confidence. Kim, you're right. He has to gain his confidence. He has to be able to catch the ball. But I, I truly think the X factor, the X factor is, is, is Sims. I think Sims, a lot of people don't expect a lot out of him. He can run uh, better than people expect. He yeah. can catch the ball uh, extremely well. And he's well conditioned. I think he's, he's passed his concussion issues from last year. And he's a guy that I think if you can get him involved in the offense you you definitely have a great one two punch but these guys have to they have to be into the game i think coach gase has to get them in early and, and get their confidence going and, and those guys have to get into a flow and the rhythm of the offense and i think once they start to find their niche in the offense i think you see our, our, our tight ends become a lot more productive but again when you have adam gase and you look at the way that Julius Thomas was used uh, when Coach Gase was was in Denver. You you definitely see the same things with uh, Jordan Cameron, and I and I, and I think uh, he has to be able to to envision himself in that type of role. Uh, let's flip over to the other side, and uh, Gronkowski uh, he, he's still he's still kind of nursing things around here. Not sure if he's going to be healthy or not for the game. I'm kind of expecting that he's probably going to play in this game. Uh, well, like I said, I haven't seen the New England injury report today uh, as far as who practiced and at what level they practice today, but uh, they're going to try to get Gronk in there as much as they can. But they also have Martellus Bennett on the other side. And the one thing that New England wants to do with a healthy uh, Gronkowski is they want to play double tight. They want to come out double tight with those two guys because they can run the ball, because they can both block. Yes. 
and they can be effective throwing the ball to both those guys because both of them have the ability to catch the ball and make plays. And, you know, I, I would love nothing else than to see Gronk out for another week and sit over there with the, uh, you know, with, with his boy Tom Brady and watch the game from the sideline or wherever they watch the game from. Not sure we're going to be that, that, uh, uh, that lucky, but if you want to shut down that offense, especially if Gronk's in, yeah. uh, with those two guys, it, that makes it, it makes it twice as difficult as it did when you've had that big, big hound dog on the one side. Now they got two of them running around there. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think when it comes to shutting down the offense of the New England Patriots, when Rob Gronkowski's in there, I think you have to commit one guy to him. I think you have to make this guy go. You have to give him a one way go, or you have to make it tough for him when you when he lines up uh, tight. Because again, it's it's a lot more difficult for the tight end to release yeah. when he's tight than when he when he's uh, when he split out. And then you have Martellus Bennett who makes it even more difficult. Now you have to drop a another outside yeah. linebacker down, but you also have two guys that not only can stretch the defense, but that can run and catch the football, and and they're both threats. Yep. I mean, and and you've seen what what the New England Patriots can do when they have two healthy tight ends. They, I mean, they've had some guys there that that can uh, that can really catch the football. So right now they they've they've added another piece to Martellus Bennett, and I think the key to that is really shutting both of those guys down. But you have to be committed to making Gronkowski making it tough on Gronkowski instead of giving him a free uh, a free release, and that's why he's killing everybody is because he gets these free. Releases. Releases. Yeah, and then you add to that Julius Edelman, who is a guy that, you know, there's that 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 chair that that you know went from Wes Welker to uh, <laughs> with Danny Woodhead uh, to to Ammon or to uh, uh, Julius Edelman, yeah. and and they're all the same guys. Yes, I I, I, could, I could go to sleep at night and see them running that little crossing route, Brady leading them where they got where they can catch Absolutely. the ball without breaking stride and, <laughs> and running off down the field. It's begun it's become quite disgusting over the years <laughs> watching those guys, but they're all very good. And Danny Amendola on the other side. Uh, so you, you can see that offense. I mean, they're really – they've got their injury problems on offensive line they're dealing with. Obviously Tom, obviously, Tom Brady's not there. But – and there was a – we had a question here just a little bit ago uh, about uh, Sally Cheese, which, you know, some of these people with these names that they're coming up with, I ain't buying it all the time, <laughs> Sally Cheese. Well, if that's your name, I apologize. But, you know, anyway. Uh, the, her, the, his – her question was, what's the best way we can slow down the Pats offense? And I think getting Gronk out of the game, yeah. trying to trying to reroute one of those tight ends, those tight ends a little bit and finding some way to disrupt the timing between Jimmy Garoppolo yeah. and, and mainly Julian Edelman. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think another way for those guys to, to kind of disrupt their offense is to kind of mix up the coverages. You have to be able to get up in their face and quick jam those guys, but also plan a little bit of zone as well. So I, I think if you're able to mix some some zone and some man coverages. But more importantly, the main thing, again, is getting pressure on Garoppolo. I mean, we have to be able to do that. And I think if you're getting that pressure, you're pushing the pressure, you're pushing the pocket, you're able to mix up, you know, a zone, you're able to mix up a little man. But more importantly, you're able to, to, to actually – commit somebody yeah. to stopping these tight ends, rerouting those guys, I think that's a great way to slow those guys down. Now, I'm not going to say that you you can't stop them yeah. because they're going to make plays. They get paid to make plays as well. But you'll be able to slow those guys down, get them to, to be, get out of rhythm, but more importantly, force them into turnovers. And, and I, I think when you look at the turnover battle um, to any football game, um, if, you, if you're winning the turnover battle, you're winning the football game. Troy, let, let me ask you this. You, you were a tight end. And you were a tight end back in the day when when teams did this. Why does nobody jam the tight ends at the line of scrimmage? Reroute tight ends <laughs> at the line. I, I this has been a this has been a sort because look when I played outside linebacker for the Dolphins, Bill Arnsbar was our defensive coordinator. If I didn't jam that tight end, if I didn't get a hand on the tight end, and look, if he took an inside release on me, I was going to try to jam him all the way down to the center Absolutely. if I could. Yeah. Because, you know, the thought being, if I can take him off of his route, I'll get back to my area of coverage, yeah. but I'm going to take care of, take one guy out of the route. If he's going outside, I'm going to try to push him as far out as I can. Now, man, it's just right down the middle of the field. No, no, you know, they just get free release and they run down the field. I, I just don't know why the culture of the national, and this is a cultural thing yes. in the National Football League. They don't even try anymore. No, you know what I think? I honestly think um, the, the their priorities have changed. Yeah. When we've, you know, it was about stopping the run. 
Yeah. And, you know, now it's about getting to the passer. It's about getting to the quarterback. And nobody's committing that outside linebacker who was over your head. Yeah. His sole responsibility is to reroute you or make sure that he gives you a one-way go. When you were playing go. tight end, how, how tough was it to get off the oh, line of scrimmage? it was tough. I yeah. mean, you, you, I actually <laughs> had to, to take an extra, extra split just yeah. to give myself a little bit yeah. of room so that I'm able to maneuver. So to me, you, you know, I didn't care if they knew it was a pass yeah. play, but ultimately I needed to give myself more room yeah, yeah, so that I'm able but, to maneuver. But look, for me, Troy, if I'm lining up against you and you take that split, <laughs> I'm going to step inside of you exactly. and I'm going to give you the inside release. Exactly. Then I'm going to force you out one way, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's always, there, you know, there's a point counterpoint yeah. to everything in this league or, or every position you play and, you know, that's the that's the thing now. And, and I've had this conversation with coaches and asked them, hey, why don't you guys, and they said, well, you know what? The, the tight ends are they're more athletic now than when you played. Well, you no. know what? If they're more athletic than when I played, then it, it, that leads to me to believe that then the linebackers are more athletic yes. than when I played too. So they should be able to get the job done. But man, it is a it is a lost art in yeah. the National Football League. I, I think the philosophy has changed. Ultimately, again, they're committing another guy to the pass rush. And to me, when you're when you're thinking about the pass rush, that is all the teams care about. Yeah, teams don't care about they care about stopping the run, but they care about getting to the quarterback more than they care about yeah. stopping the tight end. And and when you have special Special guys in the league like, you know, Rob Gronkowski, Jimmy Graham, yeah. all of these tight ends who are putting up these crazy numbers. Even Tony Gonzalez, he'll tell you during the course of his time that the defenses have changed, the 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 philosophy yeah. of the defense has changed. And I think that's why you see the tight ends putting up huge numbers is because they're getting free releases. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Clayton Knowles wants to know, uh, can we trust our running game more in the red zone and can we expect to see Jay Ajayi work his way back into the rotation? Well, I think Jay. I think you know Jay it depends on how he how he plays this week. I know the Dolphins. They want to have him in there. They want to have him in there to help spell uh, Arian Foster a little bit. So yes, they do want him back in, and that's one of the things I was going to bring on the program today. They need to find a way to get this running game going, but because if you can't get the running game going, it's going to be a long, hard season for Ryan Tannehill. Because I, I know the offensive line is 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 has been revamped. I think it's much better than we've seen in the last handful of years. But if you can't run the football, boy, that's going to be a death knell in the National Football League because teams just pin their ears back and, and, and go after the football. So you, you've got to establish that running game. The Dolphins didn't do a very good job of it last week. I think the Miami Dolphins and Ryan Tannehill is a better quarterback when our running game is at its best. We have to be able to run the football. And and I think the games that we were winning and even the games that we were in, you've seen the running game progress. But more importantly, you had a lot of play-action pass. You had a lot yeah. of play, play-action play fakes. And Ryan Tannehill was able to get outside of the pocket. I think Ryan Tannehill's success depends on our run. With Arian Foster, Jay Ajayi, you're right. We have to get our front four or five yeah. guys going because – his success and the team's success and the offensive success is determined by the running game. It just opens everything up, you know. It's like having a clog in a drain. You got to punch it out and get things going a little bit, you know. And you can't clog things up that in there. It makes it too tough. Uh, you're watching uh, the Audible here on Facebook on Miami on the Miami Dolphins Facebook page. You're also seeing us on Periscope, and you can watch us on MiamiDolphins.com live. Kim Bocamp or Troy Drayton with you. Big game this weekend. Dolphins travel up to Foxborough to face New England. Just got the injury report for the New England Patriots. Let me pass that on to you. Eric Rowe, the cornerback, is out with an ankle. Dante Hightower uh, he hasn't practiced all week. He's doubtful with a knee. I'd be surprised if he plays. All the rest of this group are questionable. Malcolm Butler, the cornerback. Offensive lineman Marcus Cannon, who's already the backup for, I think he's the backup for Volmer uh, in the game. Their offensive lineman, Jonathan Cooper. He's got a foot. Trey Flowers, shoulder. Rob Gronkowski, hamstring. Offensive lineman Shaq Mason. He's got a hand injury. Linebacker Shea McClellan, shoulder, offensive tackle Nate Solder, hamstring, and a wide receiver Chris Hogan uh, with a shoulder. So those are the uh, those are the, the situations. Q Dantley, we need Parker. Coach Gay's called Parker a level three player. What does that mean? I'm not sure what he means by a level three player. <laughs> All I know is that he can run, he can jump. He can catch the football, and when the ball's up in the air and it's a 50-50 ball, more times than not, he's going to come down with it, and he's a difference maker. Maybe those are the three. Maybe that's the three. Look at my fingers all crooked and everything. Else. But may, maybe that's the three there. And all I know is this. Uh, you can call him whatever number you want to play. Yeah. When he gets on the football field, he's a ball player. No, absolutely. I, I, I think I say one word that describes 
Parker is explosive. Yep. I mean, anytime he gets the football in the hand, he's he's he has a chance to go the distance. He can break tackles. He's going to go up and get the ball at the next level. And he is exactly what this what this Miami Dolphin offense needs. We need that big receiver, but we need him on a consistent basis. And right now, he has to get this injury bug out of his system. Yep. He has to get on the football field yeah. for this Miami and stay on Miami football Dolphin field. football team. And but more importantly, he has to gain Ryan Tannehill's confidence. Yep. I mean. Again, you know, last the latter part of the year he came on strong, but he hasn't, you know, he's been in and out out when it comes to training camp. Right now is the time for Parker to to come in, prove himself, but more importantly to gain Ryan Tannehill's confidence because again, this offense can be a lot more explosive with a guy like Parker uh helping Landry out, but more importantly making sure this running yeah. game is getting going. Troy, how many times did you play up in Foxborough? Man, I played up. I played up there a lot. Right. Yeah, played up there a lot. It, it, it's a tough place to play. Yeah. It really is. But you know, um, you know, you like the crowd. You you like the fact that you know you're going up there in enemy territory yeah. and you have a chance to win a football game. And we haven't been very successful up there in the last few years. But you know what? Every year you have a chance to go up there and break that streak. And I think this yep. this is one of those years where this Miami Dolphin team, if they execute all three phases mm -hmm. of the game. I definitely think this team can actually go up there and pull out a victory. I think they've gotten a, I think they've gotten a little more um, cordial. Let me put it that way. Since they moved into Gillette Stadium, I remember in the old Schaefer Stadium, it was one of the one of the, I remember playing a game there, and uh, we're all standing around on the side while you know while offense is in. We're on the side, and all of a sudden there's we were a big thud right in the ground next to us, and someone had thrown a bolt. The bolt was about that big, a big yeah. bolt. Landed right down, and we're going. You imagine if they had to hit somebody. In it. <laughs> I, I you know, if from then on, it became a helmets only stadium. Yeah. You walk once you came out of the locker room, you threw your helmet on. You didn't take it on, <laughs> take it off until you <laughs> until you came back out. I don't know. I don't think it's quite that. Uh, I don't think it's quite that volatile, that hostile up there now. But uh, they have a way of uh, they have a way of letting you know. And then, and that's one of those stadiums, much like Seattle last week, where if the Dolphins look, actually the Dolphins last week kept the crowd pretty much out of the yeah. football game. Yeah. Never gave them the opportunity to make that huge play early in the game that would ignite them. I think that's uh, I think that's something they've got to pull out of their uh, their their game plan and try to get it done again this week up there. You know, but one of the things that I liked about what this Miami Dolphin team did, they played. 60 minutes of yeah. football and I can't say in the, in the last couple of years that I've seen the Miami Dolphin football team play a, a 60 minute game and to me this is a different era when you're, when you're talking about coming in in a home stadium enemy territory and you're down and you're you're still fighting at the end of the game I mean that that shows you the kind of coach that Adam yeah. Gase is it was a chess match the whole game and ultimately it came down to your their best players making the plays yeah. and that, and and that's Russell Wilson and and that's their their big yep. time receiver uh so you know and and things happen teams make plays but more importantly if you go out and you play 60 minutes some of those wins, some of those losses that we had in years past yeah. will now turn into wins because our team plays 60 minutes of football. Well, you know, well look at it. I mean, last week was a great example. I mean, you know, that's a two-point ball game. Yes. You make one of those field goals, you catch a, catch a pass that may have gone for a touchdown, you do some of those things, and, uh, and you make it happen. But, you know, these these, you know, most of these games are going to come down to a field goal or yeah. so. So one play here or there certainly makes a big difference. You're watching the Audible here, Kimbo Camper, Troy Drayton with you. We're on Facebook Live. Uh, you can catch us on the Miami Dolphins Facebook page. You can catch us on MiamiDolphins.com and on Periscope. Bring your questions in via Facebook. would like to get as many answers as we can. Okay, uh, one of the questions here, uh, Seattle, or, or David Weatherman James, I wonder was our defense actually good last week or was it a bad offense from Seattle? Well I, I think it was I think I think our defense played very well. I think the guys up front played extremely well. I think Xavier Howard played well. I think Isa Abdul Kadus played well. Yeah. I think Rashad Jones played well. I think there were a lot of guys that played well. Kiko Alonso graded out well on, on the, I think he had eleven tackles in the game and yeah. you know although he didn't he didn't jump out at you yeah. played pretty well. So yeah I, I think it was a little bit and you know maybe the reason that Seattle's offense didn't look very effective is because of the way the Dolphin defense played. I'm not going to take anything away from the Dolphin defense and the way they played in, in a very, very difficult place to play. No, absolutely. I mean, when you look at what this Miami Dolphin defense did to a, a very good offense, I mean, they were able to shut down the run somewhat. And, but more or less, they contained the pass. And, and, and containing Russell Wilson is a job in itself. Yes. And, and again, when you have defensive end like Mario, a guy who's not allowing him to get outside and he has to pull it up early, that's the experience that you need yep. on the corner 
uh, on, on the corner of your defense to say, hey, you know, it's a different defense. It's a different mentality. We have discipline. We're playing discipline. And again, when you look at the penalties, like you said, yep. that was one of the things that you mentioned in the, at the top of the show. The Dolphins didn't have that many penalties. Yep. Last year, we probably would have had a lot of penalties and, and, and things would have went a lot differently. But this year, bringing in, you know, Coach Joseph's defense and, and Adam Gase as the head coach, you see – our defense is is, is attacking. Yep. They're nonstop. But more importantly, they're consistent. And, and that's the thing that I really like about this defense is that across the board, guys play consistent, and they played hard. And, and to me, I think that's the type of defense that you need. That Those are some of the things that we were lacking last year. But playing 60 minutes of football is, is one of those things. The effort that this team gave uh, is, is an effort that you need – to go forward, yep. and it's the effort that you need to get yourself into the playoffs. Yep. Willie Ortiz, uh, when are we going to allow more audibles for Tannehill? Well, they're allowing uh, him to make changes. Yeah, let, let me let me let me kind of clear this up a little bit because everyone's oh, he's not. You know, I think every, everyone's seen Peyton Manning back there with his all his histrionics and pointing and this and that and calling this. And you're not going to see that out of Ryan Tannehill. Now he made some changes to the line of scrimmage in Seattle. And he's done so through the preseason game, but it may not be as, it may not be as visible to you out there. The, and the other thing he asks is. Also, why don't they call more plays to his right and making plays? I'm not sure exactly what that means, but look, most teams are right-handed, and this is a right-handed football team. They ran plenty of plays. Over to, if that's what you're asking, I don't know. All I know is that wording on that question, I can't figure out what you're saying. All right, here's what Frank says. Hey, Troy, what was it like playing in L.A.? You played in L.A. for the Rams. Yes. yes so, uh, so here's a question. What was it like so now that the Rams are back there, where, by the way, they belong and should have been the yes, whole time? Absolutely. Um, what was it like playing in L.A.? Uh, it was great. I mean, I was talking. You played in Anaheim. Yeah, I played in yes. Anaheim. So uh, it, it was is a great place to play. I mean, the 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 downside is it is that we weren't a good football team at the yeah. time, and you know, if you had an opponent come into our stadium, it was like a home game for that opponent. But the fans that were there, the fans that are at our stadium, were passionate fans. The you know, ultimately, you're in L.A. And if you're not winning, then there's a lot of people out there with a lot of money to do other things. Yeah. There's so many things out there to do. So right now, there is there is a, a passion. That passion has come back for the Rams. That They miss their football team. But more importantly, you have people going to the stadium. They want to spend their money. Yeah. They're interested in the football team. And, and right now is a time you have a young football team that has a lot of potential. So... As long as as long as they can continue to go up, I think people will continue to support them. But L.A. is a great place, yep. and I think L.A. is one of those places that deserves a football team. And if you ask me, we should have never left yeah, L.A. We should have just stuck it through. The, and, the and amazing thing to me is that do. everyone's romanticizing the Coliseum there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're going back to one of the great venues in, in, in sports. Let me tell you what. I've been to the Coliseum many oh, a times. That place is a dump. <laughs> <laughs> the locker room is one of the worst. Oh, you wait. You wait. The visiting teams are going to go in there and go, what? Yeah. You kidding me? And this you, is where we're playing? You know what the thing about it is? It is built for the Olympics. Yes. Like what they, people don't understand is, is that there's not that intimacy. The, no, there's the, a track around that There's a track. Yeah. It's like a 12 or 15 lane track. And then you have your, then you have a wall and then your fans. Right, right, so right. it's, uh, it, it is a great venue uh, when it comes to, to playing uh, the football, but ultimately the, the nostalgia and all that yeah. is a great venue. Yeah. But uh, as a great place to play football, I'm not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Uh, Malcolm Wirtz, uh, we lost, this is this, this, I've heard this now a couple of times. Uh, and, and I heard this on the radio from you know uh, from from a, a know-it-all talk show host around here, which re really doesn't know very much on on QAM during the middays. But anyway, I'm not sure that who that is. M Malcolm Worse, we lost the chess match early by not going for the field goal on fourth down. Mm -hmm. Fourth down in inches after the 50-yard catch by uh, by Arian Foster, mm -hmm. catch and run. Uh, fourth down in inches. Uh, and, and and I asked uh, Adam afterwards. You know, you went for fourth, fourth and inches. You went for fourth. He said, "Yes, I did." And I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, for it. I'll go for it every time I'm in that situation. I like that idea. I like going fast, especially after you've made a big play. Absolutely. And, and look, they, they didn't get the job done, but I, going for it to me. I have no problem with that whatsoever. No, me either. I mean, especially when, early in the yeah, football game. Yeah, when you're talking about fourth and inches, it's only on on one team. It's on your big guys yep. up front. 
And ultimately, what happens is your guys want that. They want those type of situations to happen. And you're going to have a ton of those situations come up in, in every football game. Your guys need to want those situations to happen. And you want to give your guys those opportunities. Yep. So I would be disappointed if Coach Gase didn't go for it on yep. fourth and inches. Uh, and, and only coaches who want to win are doing it. You don't want to play it safe. You want to you want to win football games. And the only way that you're going to establish that credibility, you're going to establish that dominance, you're going to establish the confidence that your head coach has yep. the, that you have into your head co- your head coach has in the offensive line is to continue to go for yep. it on fourth and inches. And, and, let me, and it was inches. I mean, I was standing right there looking down the line. It was fourth and inches. The only thing I would say, maybe if it was, if, you know, maybe, maybe you know, I, the one thing I don't understand, I, I don't understand why in a situation like that, we don't we don't run Ryan on the, on the sneak a little bit. Yeah, he's a strong physical guy uh, <laughs> for the inches, and that would be that's my only uh, that's my only thing I'm gonna throw in there. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, Alfredo Triana, Triana uh, Ordonez, uh, do you guys think this is a must-win game for the Dolphins? I, I think every game is a must-win yes. game. I mean, when you're talking about an AFC divisional opponent, you, I think the Super Bowl and the, and the, and the, the, the crown to the AFC East goes through Foxborough. It goes through New England. And, and ultimately, you have to be able to go up there and you have to beat the champions. If you want to do anything in the AFC, it's going through New England. So, yes, this is a must win for the Miami Dolphins because every win when it comes to an AFC East opponent is a must win because you don't want – it to come down to another team having to win to get your football team into the playoffs. You want to be able to control your own destiny. So I think when you're talking about this game, the Miami Dolphins need this football game because number one, you don't want to start the season yep. 0-2. And, and number two, you need to go up and you need to go up to New England and you need to win the AFC East game on the road. And I think the other thing you add to this, you know, it's a great opportunity for the Dolphins, and I agree. They've got to go up and win this football game. Can't go 0-2. You've got to you know, you've got to find a way to start sweeping some of your AFC East. Uh, opponents, you know, you split with the Jets, you split with the uh, the Patriots, and you lose two to uh, to Buffalo. You, you you can't do that. You've got to be some the team that sweeps one, at least one of those. Yeah. You know, one, one of those teams. You got to find a way to sweep them. And you got Tom Brady sitting on the sidelines. You're not playing up there. You're not. You don't get that chance very much no. to go up to New England and play against the Patriots without Tom Brady. You've got to take advantage of that and get that in your back pocket and then worry about it. I think they play them January 1st, mm-hmm. last game of the season. And you know what? If you went up there, there's a good chance you may come down here that last game <laughs> and it's a winner-take-all type of situation. Absolutely. And look, that's all you can ask for in the National Football League. If you're playing in this league, that you've got a game like that in the last week or two weeks of the season. And, and that'd be a great situation uh, for the Dolphins to be in. So yeah, I think it's a, I don't think it's a must-win game from the standpoint that, look, you've still got time to get back in it. You can Still, but but if from a standpoint of winning divisional games, yes. important games, and forget divisional games, the team that's been riding the top of the heap of this division yeah. for over a decade now, you've got a chance to knock them off at home. I, I think this is one of those things that you've got to pull out all stops and, and figure out a way to win it. So we'll, we'll see. We'll be back Monday, and uh, we'll have the aftermath of the game up in Foxborough on Monday. Troy, it's a pleasure having you with us here, my man. No, it's a pleasure, Always man. getting an old Finsider thing going back again, huh? A little bit? Yeah, it feels good. All right, I didn't get to, I didn't get to make fun of the tight end position, but I'll do that the next time <laughs> Next time you're in. That's going to do it for the Audible this time for Troy Drayton. I'm Kim Bocamper. You can catch us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Facebook, MiamiDolphins.com, and on the Periscope. We will catch you next time. Have a good weekend, and hopefully Dolphins come away with a win and come back 1-1 one one from Foxborough. We'll see you next time.